Thank you everyone for being here, even though it's the very last uh, talk of the day. So I'm Mario, I'm part of the COE software development uh, and tooling uh, um, department of the ABN AMRO, which is a Dutch bank. But before starting, I would like to tell you something. Sometime I feel like this. And uh, I feel like we are having way too many tools to develop, way too many tools to test, way too many tools to do everything in IT. And, uh, and we're trying to simplify that. But Let's go. So ABN Ambro is a bank, so not the most exciting company probably. Um, uh, but we do a lot of mobile uh, uh, native applications. So we have uh, well, the mobile banking app, which is the main application that we do, which is where you keep track of your bank accounts, your mortgage, your insurances, things like that. But we also have some more fun applications like Crypt that al allows you to analyze a little bit more the uh, if you're spending too much on, uh, on uh, going out uh, in a month or things like that, or things like that. Uh, we have an application that's called Tiki, which is very successful, and you don't even have to uh, be one of our customers to use it. And it allows you to um, send money, so if you go out for dinner and you pay for others and you can get the money back from them, or if you sell sec some second-hand stuff, you can get money that way. Uh, or other apps like Enmare. So all these apps have something in common. And, uh, and what they have in common is that uh, they are all built uh, with native tooling only. So, what I'm talking about, what I'm gonna talk about is some principles that we follow in the bank. Um, um, the plan is on how we actually uh, uh, use this principle. Of course, there are a lot of principles in the, in the bank. I'm just not talking about something that, uh, uh, that is really applicable here. What the plan is and how do we execute those. So let's start with the principles. And those principles I'm gonna focus on are the uh, anytime release, DevOps teams, and infrastructure. So how does that apply to a bank? So uh, as many companies nowadays, we wanna release as often as possible. Today, we can release every two weeks, and actually we do release every two weeks. But the reality is that we wanna release more often. Uh, possibly completely on, uh, on demand. Um, that is actually uh, quite complicated because uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, our release pipelines, they, they need to be very, you know, if you want to do the test every time before releasing, uh, that's, that's, that's a lot of testing, right? Um, another principle that we are following is that the teams must be fully autonomous. So we are giving up, even though I, I technically belong to uh, a support team, uh, which uh, used to, to be more um, like uh, separated. Um, we want the teams, every single team, to be able to completely do everything by themselves, so no, no support necessary. And uh, this is a very important principle that we have. We are a bank. We, do, uh, we, we, we provide financial services. We are not an IT company that has to build infrastructure. So. Um, Building big IT infrastructure is not what, what, we're, what we're in the business for. So that's not what we do best. And this is a typical example. This is a screenshot for a few, from a few years ago, and today is probably just worse. And this is the typical fragmentation of the Android uh, ecosystem that we all know. So supporting this kind of stuff is, is, is hard, and it's not our job. So based on this principle, how do we, uh, will we try to, to, to plan it? Well, let's, let's go take a step back and let, let's start to see uh, what we tried to do in the past, what tools are we using, and uh, how, how does our CICD look like. So what we did we try? In 2016 and 17, uh, we created a complete full uh, um, test automation team. And, uh, and we said, okay, well, we have some requirements for this test automation team. And we want uh, possibly the business people, the POs, the business analysts that we have to start writing the test. Uh, so basically, uh, they write the story and they can also write the test that, that, uh, that maps to the story. And since we're at it, we, we, our nice uh, test automation team can, uh, can aim at having a full cross-platform tool. And so, and so they went. And, uh, and they decided to go for, for Cucumber and Gherkin that we uh, probably know. And this is, a, well, I guess you all know it, but uh, this is a simple example of a, of, a, of a simple Gherkin test. And it reads like in English. This is just a, like a Google search. But, uh, but we found out that this is actually um, 
deceptively simple um, because, because it's English. Uh, so it doesn't really um, describe in detail what is really happening. So for instance, if you look at the DEN clause, and then the results for Abiy and Amor are shown, what does that mean? Is one result enough? Do you need multiple results? Or do you need all results to, to? You don't really know what it means after you write a test. So imagine having hundreds of these tests. Um, it gets very difficult to understand if an English phrase is actually implemented the same way of another English phrase that is just phrased in a, in a slightly different way. And uh, if you start asking somebody to say, okay, well, make sure that there, are no dupl there is no duplication, there are no duplicates, um, then he has to go through hundreds of tests. And, and actually, the test itself won't, won't, won't say enough. And you know, we'll have to go through two layers of code to understand how the implementation looks like. So it appears simple, but it hides complexity and in a way that it's difficult to manage. So oh, just, just to go back, uh, there is uh, one thing is that uh, even though it looks like English, um, it is very strict. So you cannot change that phrase a little bit and pretend it's still working. So you need to be as strict as you are when you code. So talking about coders, what do they use today? Well, our coders, as I said, the applications we're talking about are fully native applications, so uh, our developers are using Xcode and Android Studio. And the nice thing is that Xcode and Android Studio come with Exitest and Expressor. They are integrated, they are part of the development. They are, they are testing tools, but they are a complete part of the development. So uh, we had a, a lot of discussions and we decided that to go for those, so to abandon our Cucumber and Gherkin strategy and go for exit test and Espresso. But the question is, that are we losing something? Well, yes, we are losing two things fundamentally. Uh, one is we're losing cross-platform compatibility because uh, exit test and Espresso are, are very easy in, 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 in reality to use, are conceptually very similar, uh, but, but, they are, but, but they are different. You have to implement the same functionality twice. And then we're losing another thing, is that requirement that we had that uh, product owners and business analysts uh, to be able to, to write the test themselves. Well, lucky part is that they never did, so we didn't really lose anything. Um, talking about the CI-CD, um, integration has been said before in, in some other presentation. Um, um, if we add a tool that is not a native tool, and we have to put that in the CI-CD, that means that there is extra dependency, extra steps that we have to add to our pipelines. Um, if the tool is completely native, is completely uh, embedded in the platform, then uh, that, that is, uh, the complexity there is reduced. So how would you execute it on the, all this? Well, we, we adopt the source lab, that's one of the reasons we are here. And uh, one of the good part is that they, mas they manage the devices for us. We just heard that uh, uh, they go a long, uh, long way to manage all the, the, that complexity, all that uh, fragmentation of devices. They also do something which we find very nice. We are a l relatively large organization, so we need uh, user management uh, and group management. We need to know who has access to what. And they're doing, they, they do that, and they are, they, are, they are improving on that. So that's, that's, that's very nice for us. Um, in principle, we would like to ask, for instance, uh, uh, which user has used which device when, right? So that's a, that's a, that's a nice thing. And of course, they support taxi test and espresso, so that's a, uh, when, we, when we had to select a partner, this was, uh, was, uh, was, of course, a deal breaker. And there is an extra thing. They also support web. So I don't do anything with web at all. I'm a mobile developer, like I said, and I always worked on uh, native tools. But apparently, uh, SOSLAB is a big thing on, on web, so that's nice that, is, uh, that we have that as well. And I'm going to talk quickly now on uh, uh, what kind of tests we're running. So we're running mostly on, on, on the source lab uh, uh, facilities, UI tests and end-to-end -end tests. The unit tests are run locally on, uh, on, on Jenkins, um, on-premise. So we have, uh, just, just to be clear, um, 
be with UI tests, I mean tests that only look at specific elements of the UI. They just look at the button, that it look, it look in a certain way, that when you, or, or a text field that checks that, uh, uh, that the, the, the text that you input is correct, but they don't, they don't look at anything outside that. And end-to-end -end tests are actually, well, what the name says, end-to-end -end tests, are not, not particularly complicated. So we have three pipelines running today. We have the main pipeline, which is the one that, that, that runs on every commit. And, uh, and uh, it does uh, a long number of things. Uh, it does uh, uh, um, code scanning for quality, code scanning for security, builds the app, obviously. And it also runs on our premises some smoke tests on simulators. Um, and that has to be fast. Uh, it will still take quite a few minutes, especially because the code scanning is, is a relatively slow process, but we need to stay within 10 minutes. Then we have a completely separate pipeline for our UI tests, and that's running on, uh, on, on, on Sonslab. That's actually taking advantage of Sonslab. Um, and finally, we have a, a daily build or a nightly build for end-to-end for, for -end tests. So the main pipeline, what it does is, 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 is pretty, pretty straightforward. So it builds the app, run unit test. Uh, as I said, uh, a quality test, uh, we use SonarCube, as mentioned also before, uh, uh, we use uh, security checks. Um, and then we run smoke tests, which are basically uh, um, uh, a subset of the end-to-end -end test run against the local mock server. And then it notifies us with Slack if something goes wrong. And this is something you can get on your Slack when something does go wrong. Then we have our UI test pipeline. And I'm also uh, writing that obviously not everything is implemented and not everything is perfectly running all the time, but that's, that's I guess, normal. Um, and this UI test pipeline runs hourly. Uh, and uh, one, one interesting bit is that it runs on, uh, on a number of devices. So, so, for instance, on Android, we have a, a reference device, which is, uh, today is a, is a Galaxy S8, because that's the most adopted device among our customers. And then it selects randomly four other devices uh, uh, every hour, so that we can uh, spot uh, malfunctioning on some specific devices. It also notifies via Slack. Um, does not require a server, that's very interesting because, uh, as, as I said before, it only checks that specific UI components behave as expected, so no network communication. And the other interesting thing is that it does not require a, a Mac to run. Um, and this is because the main pipeline has already created the, the, the test builds and stored them somewhere uh, so that a Docker container uh, or that, is, uh, that is actually running this thing We'll just pick up those builds, send it to Salslab, and, and run it there. And this is important because uh, from, um, let's say, security and compliance reason, we need to have the Mac uh, machines on our, uh, on our own data centers. But because Macs are somehow foreign to the uh, data center uh, uh, policies, it's always a little bit tricky to add new Macs there, etc. So we have a limited number of those. And uh, uh, so it's handy that we don't need to add more Macs to that. And this is a quick example of what the uh, UI tests look like. Uh, we have a functionality in the, in the mobile banking app that allows you to register yourself as a new customer. So you have to put your address, your, uh, your postcode, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to show the entire video, but what we are only checking at this point is that all the, the, the field verifications are working fine. All right. So yeah, I'm not going to show you it all. I suppose, uh, do I go next here? All right. Then we have the end-to-end -end test pipeline. This is the uh, closest to reality system that we have pipeline we have. It runs nightly, and the reason it does is that, of course, it takes a long time. And it starts by running all our end-to-end -end tests against a mock server. Uh, a mock server, we use, uh, uh, specifically, we use Wimock. 
Wiremock is an open source uh, Java uh, mock server. And uh, we run it locally, so during development, uh, a developer can run, uh, can develop using the mock server locally, and then we host it on a, on a Lambda on AWS. The reason we did that is that uh, um, it's not possible for devices which are in, uh, or there are a lot of restrictions, let's say, for devices which are in source lab to connect with servers which are internal to the bank. And uh, so we have some VPN uh, uh, set up, uh, but there are, there are restrictions that, that are hard to overcome. So we just decided to, to, to create some code and deploy it on a Lambda, which is publicly accessible, and, uh, and use the same configuration files that Wiremock use on that Lambda. So that also notifies us via Slack when something goes wrong. It also does not require Mac to run, even for iOS. And if everything goes fine, then it will rerun all the tests against the test environment. What is a test environment? So you have to imagine that the, the bank has a very deep stack. And when I mean a deep stack, we have uh, uh, from REST services, which are uh, just the uh, Java services, but they go down uh, an enterprise service bus, and then they end up in mainframes. We have a full stack for testing only, which is a complete replica of our production stack. And even the data that are in that test stack are, are just scrambled data from the production stack. Now, that is very deep. So if something goes wrong there, it can be very tricky to understand what goes wrong. That's why we leave it for uh, only when we know that our part is most likely not the one going wrong, so the mock server runs, everything seems to be fine, then only then we, we, we actually run against that. And this, these are actually simulators, not, not, not a video. The previous one was actually a video taken from, from, uh, from, from Source Lab. This is a, actually a simulator uh, video, but these are actually tests running against the mock server. These are local, and here we use the parallelization that uh, Xcode has also added. And, uh, and, and the other thing that you can notice is that also these are quite fast tests. So mock server are a little bit slower, obviously, than, uh, than, uh, than local UI tests, but are pretty fast. So I totally recommend those. So. Oops. Ah, okay, and this is the best part. And I've been very fast, uh, but this is the integration in the pipeline. This is the command that you have to give to, to run this kind of test. So uh, it's a, just a Java application that Source Lab provides you. You just specify if it's Android, if it's iOS. You specify the test APK uh, that is generated when you, when, when you just build the, build the application and the application APK. API key is, a, is the same that you would use for, for Hapium. The data center, this is a key part for us. Uh, for uh, compliance reasons, we are required to run everything that we do only in Europe. We cannot run in the States, anything. So the data center has to be in the EU. Uh, I think we're working also with SoftSub to prevent our users to do anything on, uh, in, in, in the States. And in this specific case, we are running on this uh, uh, specific Samsung uh, uh, Note 8. And that, as you see, is AB, so it's a private device for, for AB and AMRO. Uh, and we normally, this, this is an example, obviously, we normally use a little bit more complicated command that uses an XML file to allow for running on, uh, on multiple devices. And I think that, that was it. So I've been faster than expected, probably missed some stuff. <laughs> is there any question? <laughs> Hi. So um, you decided to switch your strategy to instead of using APM to go with native um, platform support. Would you say that it was worth it losing that um, cross-platform support? Yes. So we didn't use APM. We never really adopted APM. We were using Cucumber and Gherkin. And we actually had a big investment in that because we had uh, a year and a half in which this, uh, uh, this uh, test uh, uh, automation team was doing work. But what we, what we noticed, the, the, the biggest problem there was that was something was, was going wrong. 
Um, so the, the build was failing, and uh, uh, developers say, were saying like, it's, it's, it's not a problem. We haven't written that that that, that code. So you test automation team go figure uh, whether it's your test that is flaky, your framework that is not working, or if it's actually a real problem for us. Now, there was one test automation team and nine times, uh, seven to nine uh, uh, application teams. So this test automation team was becoming a bottleneck and it was becoming responsible for maintaining this framework that was trying to ensure uh, cross-platform uh, uh, compatibility and figuring out what was going wrong during the builds. Now, what happens is that if, if a build fails, and uh, developers don't take responsibility. They, they pinpoint the, the test automation team and they say, now you, you go figure first if it's my problem. In the meantime, development keeps going, right? And then they keep committing stuff and, uh, and the build is broken, uh, but you don't know anymore where. Um, so, so that team was becoming uh, overloaded with work um, developers were not really helpful in that sense because it was not their decision, it was not their framework, Cucumber was not their thing. While nowadays, it's much easier because uh, uh, developers feel responsible, the tools that we're using are their tools, uh, they are willing to help the testers, so that's, that's one part I probably I didn't stress. Uh, uh, the developers are really working with testers to uh, to, to build those test cases, to teach them. Uh, that, that one problem testers have, of course, is that tests now in XUI and in Espresso have to be built in, in, in Swift and Kotlin, right? Um, but developers feel responsible, so they are, they are helping, they are building those tests, and they're fixing the test or, 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 or the code when something breaks. So, uh, yes, we lost uh, uh, the cross-platform, but we got a lot more people that actually work on the build when it breaks. Uh, because before it was just the test automation team that was starting to look at the problem, now it's really everybody feeling responsible for it. So the one who actually commit the code really looks at what breaks. So um, yeah, we lose the cross-platform, but we get a lot more people working on the, on, uh, on, on, on the failure, so that, that's totally worth it. We lost uh, a year and a half of, uh, of effort. Yes, that, that, that's true. So we had a bit, this big framework that we somehow had to throw away. So that's, that was a, a loss, but you have to take those decisions. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that in your team is the developers and tester writing both UI tests, right? Yeah. So how do you divide the responsibility, like which test, test automation developers write and which developers write? How do you... How do you coordinate that effort? Because there is actually no fixed distinction. Okay. Um, the idea is that, uh, um, so, so f first of all, there is still some little manual testing, some little bits that uh, uh, Source Lab cannot automate, like a fingerprint, uh, a camera scanning. So we have a few things that, that are actually, uh, today, we, we still need to do manually. So those are still responsibility of the tester that becomes back a manual tester. Mm -hmm. But uh, aside from when it does the manual testing job, which is also can, can be done by developers, it's not, there is no strict distinction, we, are really, we really want the uh, testers to be able to write code uh, and developers to take responsibility to write their test. Uh, and, but, but what we saw is that developers don't, don't have a problem anymore because it's their thing. So it really becomes their thing, so it doesn't, they, they don't have an obstacle. And testers really appreciate the fact that they are learning uh, how to write, actually write code. We even saw some testers that when the developers were, uh, were on holiday, started to implement some features, which is great. Uh, and as always, there is a double check, uh, so some code review stuff, but, but, but uh, we, we really like that. But do you face any resistance from developers that they don't want to write UI tests and all that stuff, or it was pretty seem it was? No, the, 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 the problem with not writing the, U, the, the UI test was only about the framework. They didn't want to go outside their IDE, outside their comfort zone to get to, to, uh, to another framework. And then we know also that there is uh, this, uh, especially on Apple, um, there is this feeling uh, that it will break eventually. So if you go everywhere that it's not Apple, it will eventually break because Apple will break it. Um, so they were also not willing to invest into a, 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 another tool. So we, we heard also that sometime Appium has some, some, some problems when, uh, when a new version of iOS comes up. And, um, 
Uh, that's understandable. That's Apple policy. No, nobody can do anything about it apart from Apple. So that's, uh, that's the way it is. But it was only about that. They don't have a problem writing UI tests uh, uh, and things like that. If anything, now testers feel obliged to, to code too much. <laughs> but that's OK. <laughs> I <clears throat> had a quick question. Earlier this morning, there was a session where somebody asked if they could write an espresso test against a pre-configured APK. Is that possible, or does it have to be inside of that project? We work with a vendor, so we, would, so we have to use cross-platform. So say that again. So we, when, when the application is built, it builds a test APK and, 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 and the application APK, and mm -hmm. those are the ones that we, 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 we launch on, uh, on, on, on Source Lab. So we get the APK from our vendor. Can we write a test in Espresso to go to test that APK, or does it have to be uh, within to write that project? It externally from, uh, from, from, from uh, in Android Studio. So now, now the test, actually, the great advantage is that you write the test together with your code. Uh, so uh, most likely it's possible. We don't do it. I wouldn't advise doing it. Uh, so in Android, I, I, I always take the, the thing that everything is possible if you really want to. Uh, because the test APK is actually a different APK. I suspect that it's doable, uh, but uh, we don't do it. So I wouldn't know exactly how to do it. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how you keep your mock server in sync with your actual service? OK, so uh, that's, that's a long story. In, 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 in the past, um, um, we had a, a, a a push from the top so that every team building services were supposed to uh, to create uh, the stubs or mocks for, 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 for their own services. That did not happen. Um, so the, uh, the problem is that at the end of the day, if, uh, um, if the application doesn't work, uh, the first one who gets the information is the, 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 the front-end uh, developer, the, 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 the application developer. So it ends up that the application developers are the one uh, keeping the smoke server uh, um, up and running. And yes, it can go wrong. So if a service is changed and we don't get notified for some reason, and, uh, and so our test against the mock will still succeed, but, uh, but they will fail against the real service. That's when uh, the end-to-end the -end testing uh, uh, against the test environment will actually show us something. But that has occurred once, as far as I know, so far. So um, I'm quite confident that it's, we're, we're, we're safe with that. They don't really change often. Let's put it this way. Cool. Uh, thanks, Amro. Uh, great talk. Uh, I have a quick question about your team structure, like iOS team and Android team. So do you have a QA engineer with the specific skills that uh, iOS needed or Android needed, or do you expect that QA engineers should do both iOS and Android? So um, our teams are eight to 10 people. Um, we, we try to have like uh, uh, two iOS, two Android, and one or two QA. Um, uh, but we are trying to cross the gap also be among developers. So uh, some developers are a little bit stubborn there. They don't really, I mean, if it's iOS, they don't want to do Android and vice versa, but we are trying to push a little there. And, uh, and, and, and the same applies for QA. So there is, uh, the idea is that you can't be locked in, 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 into a platform. Then, of course, your, you, you will know more of your platform than on the other. Uh, but we regularly have, uh, that's typically when have, uh, what happens when, when people go on holiday. Um, uh, somebody from, from the other side, let's say, uh, will have to, uh, to make sure that there, there is no misalignment. Because also, because if you have to release very often, uh, you, you, we will not accept a misalignment between what we release on iOS and what we release on Android. So if we want to deliver a feature in a week and somebody is on holiday that week, somebody else will have to, to, to code that part. And if that somebody else is um, working on the other platform normally, well, that's, you will have to learn on, to work on both. Again, maintaining the specialization when needed. Also, we have uh, seven teams working on the same application. 
so what happens is that uh, if there is a need for help, they can quickly go to another team uh, to ask for help. It's not that uh, we have uh, uh, silos. Any other questions? One more question about the uh, mock servers, maybe. Um, do you think that um, adding the, the mock servers would help you in decreasing the complexity of the environment and debugging um, your uh, errors that you get, like establishing a root cause analysis? Yes, that's exactly how we use it. So where mock is used during development, um, consider that uh, if we were not using mock server, uh, every, uh, every, uh, the entire development process would be very slow. Uh, because as I said, we have the full uh, um, uh, test environment, uh, which is a replica of the product, or a, a scramble replica of the production environment. But that means that there, even just to log in, you have to have an actual user. And sometimes those users are difficult to find uh, because somebody else is using them, or they don't have the right configuration, or there is something that, that is not what you need from that user. Say that you're trying to, to, to implement a notification or some, some, some kind of message for a specific kind of user that has his account in a very specific state. Uh, finding that kind of user in the, in the, in the real test environment might take some time. Um, so you do it on a mock server. So the entire development or most of the development happens on a mock server, uh, which, which is why we use WireMock, which can be run locally as just as a Java runnable. Um, and, uh, and we use exactly the same configuration files in a Lambda, in a Lambda function that we publish on, uh, on AWS. So yes, uh, uh, mock server are absolutely a must for us. Right, thank you. If there's no one else, let's have a round of applause for Mario. Thank you so much. Thank you.